Hi, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar on summarizing the year for online brand protection 2023. This is the concluding webinar for us for this year, and we are happy to spend it, to spend it today with us, uh, who, all of you who are joining us today. Uh, my name is Alona Bozemska, and I head up the commercial department for the main crawler. And besides that, I find great pleasure in hosting online events, just the webinars like this one. And today we'll dive into the trends and challenges the industry faced this year and all of the opportunities that might or might not arise the next year in 2024. And as always, our webinars won't be possible without the great speakers. And today we have two of them. Uh, I'll start with David Barnett, Brand Strategies at Stops. David has almost 20 years of experience in the online brand protection industry. And since July 2023, David has been working a, as brand protection strategist at Stops. He is an experienced thought leader with the extensive portfolio of articles and experience of speaking at the industry events. And besides that, uh, David uh, is the author of Brand Protection in the Online World. So that is really exciting. And welcome, David. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Yeah, and our second speaker is, of course, Richard Wickstrom, the founder of Domain Crawler. Richard has an extensive uh, expertise in hosting domain names and everything when it comes to the SEO and IT security. Throughout his career, he's been founder and board member in numerous companies, including Stay Secure, Home Security, Internet Vikings, and the Domain Crawler. Uh, thank you, Richard, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We're looking forward. Of course, uh, we too. And now comes my favorite, one of my actually favorite parts of the webinar is meeting the audience. So we'd love to get to know you. So I'd really encourage you to put down into the chat box uh, your name, where you're coming from, the industry where you're joining us, and any any other relevant or irrelevant, maybe fun fact you'd like to, with us to share. So feel free to put it into the chat. I know that we have a little bit of the lag between the broadcasting and the, the actual answers. So um, let's take a couple of the uh, seconds here. Yeah, we have Jens there. Hi, Jens. I know that Jens is joining us from Ireland. Um, yeah, we have Niklas Jonsson from uh, Scout Gaming Group AB Fantasy Gaming. Nice to see you, Nicholas. Yeah, and the one uh, while everyone is putting down their um, their answers, I'd just like to mention that if you have any question about the presentation or uh, the follow up questions to that, please put it again into the chat, and we'll, uh, we'll, we will make sure to come back to it during the Q and A. Now, we also can see James O'Hanlon, um, trademark and brand protection, Jake Edwards, Counterfind, also brand protection. Um, we have Robin from Los Angeles. Nice. So many great people, the industry people. So I assume we will have a very interesting conversation uh, very soon. So looking forward to that one. Hi, Margot. Yeah, really looking forward. I also would, would be interested if we have any anyone from the domain industry, like from the registry or register perspective, because I know more and more um, domain industry related companies are looking into the brand protection area uh, and that kind of services. So it would be interesting to see if we have any of them today. Hi, Amanda, corporate domain name a provider in Sweden, .keeper. Have our friends there, so that's great. All right, so really nice to meet all of you today with us. Really uh, appreciate your time and uh, the opportunity that you joined us. Um, so we aim to address again as many possible as many as possible questions during the 
uh, webinar. And if you have any other questions after it, please send it to us and we'll make sure to answer them as well. So uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that this webinar will be recorded and we will be sending it to you straight after the event, uh, as well as the slides of the keynote presentation. And so I guess everyone now wants to jump into the presentation and uh, the insights from that, but just I have one more announcement to make. So as Domain Crawler uh, is a provider of the domain data, we offer you exclusively uh, the brand check uh, for all of the attendees of those webinar, of this webinar. So right now we will put down the link into the chat to the web form through which you can uh, submit a brand name and we will scan the entire internet, we'll scan our database and see if there are any online brand infringements um, that can be there. So, and the best, the best part of it is that it this report will have the visual part. So you don't, you will not have to deal only with the uh, raw numbers and raw data. It will have also the charts, graphs, and everything around that. And also at the same time, again, this is the exclusive offer, and it's free for all of the webinar attendees. So I wanted to make um, that announcement. And besides that, I guess I have uh, to stop talking now. And without further ado, we'll turn the stage over to David, who will start with his keynote presentation. Please, David. The floor is yours. Thanks, Elena. Just bear with me while I share my screen. Apologies, everyone. I'm working on a single screen, so maybe a slight discontinuity while I switch over. Okay. Can everybody see that okay? Okay. Right, well, thanks everyone. Thanks uh, for having me here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about brand protection in 2023, uh, trends, challenges, uh, and opportunities, uh, really specifically with some focus on Web3 and AI uh, and a bit of a deep dive into some developments in the new GTLD industry. Okay, so in terms of what we're going to cover, I'm going to start by looking at um, some concepts relating to Web3 and artificial intelligence going over some definitions and some open questions and really looking at the interplay between AI and Web3. We're then going to spend a fair bit of time looking at the blockchain domain landscape, uh, looking at some recent studies we've done, looking at infringements targeting the top 10 most valuable global brands, uh, and also looking at some trends we're seeing in long and what I'm going to term special blockchain domain names uh, th that are being registered. And again, we'll, we'll dive more into that a little bit later. Um, the sort of second main section is going to be looking at trends and developments uh, in the new GTLD program. So looking at the status of the program since 2012 when it launched, uh, some of this year's developments, um, and then a little bit of a case study looking at some trends associated with one of the new domain extensions which has been released this year, uh, which is .zip. Um, we're then going to kind of pull it all together, going over some key points and some further thoughts, uh, and then we're going to finish by looking at some considerations uh, that brand owners may want to bear in mind. Okay, so first looking at uh, the definitions. Um, so the first thing to talk about is Web3. Um, I'm, lots of people will have been, heard people talking about Web3 online recently. Um, really what it is, is a general term uh, referring to a variety of types of decentralized content on the internet. Um, and it has a particular focus on blockchain related technologies. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and really two of the main applications that people talk about in this area is NFTs and blockchain domains. Uh, they're both really different types of digital objects whose ownership is recorded on a blockchain. Uh, I'm not gonna be talking much about NFTs, but we're gonna focus on blockchain domains. Um, so first of all, I'll talk about those definitions in a little bit more detail. Um, so a blockchain is, as you can see here, a cryptographically sealed, publicly accessible digital ledger in which transactions are recorded. 
Um, essentially, it's a, it's a way of tracking transactions that cannot be modified afterwards. So with that in mind, um, it, is, it has a number of applications. One of the most familiar is the, it forms the basis of digital currencies, so things like Bitcoin, uh, but it can also be used in other contexts, particularly in the brand protection world. So things like supply chain control by brand owners, you can actually track the passage of your, your goods that you're shipping out using blockchain technologies. And that way, you know where the goods are. They can't sort of disappear from the supply chain because all of those transactions transactions are recorded. Um, when we're talking about uh, the applications of blockchain, so one of the main ones we're going to talk about today is blockchain domains. So they're kind of a bit like uh, regular domain names, but they have some key differences. So first of all, like NFTs, um, they are basically recorded on a blockchain together with their ownership details. Uh, they're not hosted sort of in a traditional sort of internet sort of familiar way um, using things like um, zone files. They're not reg regulated by ICANN. Um, and to access any websites hosted on blockchain domains, you, you need to use special access requirements. So things like particular dedicated browsers or browser add-ons. Uh, but like familiar domains, uh, sort of what we would term Web2 domains, they do in the same way consist of a second level domain name and an extension. And there's a number of extensions which are used specifically for blockchain domains. Uh, some of the most familiar ones, uh, .eth, .crypto, .bit, there's, there's, there's several more. Uh, and some of the Web3 providers we're seeing are starting to offer a lot more flexibility in the extensions that people are able to buy. Um, blockchain domains can be used for a number of different things. One of the most common use cases is as a wallet address for cryptocurrency. So rather than having a long, complicated string, which is your cryptocurrency wallet address, you know, I could, for example, register davidbarnett.eth, and you could use that to send me a payment in Bitcoin. So it makes, makes it a lot easier uh, and more user-friendly to send cryptocurrency. Um, as I've alluded to before, you can actually use uh, blockchain domains to build and host decentralized websites. And as I've said, they are accessed via specialized browsers or browser add-ons. Um, and you can use blockchain domains in a number of other ways. So for example, using them as, as the basis of hosting uh, for programs which you can run as, as decentralized apps. Um, moving now on to AI specifically, so artificial intelligence. Um, I guess one of the sort of main sort of pieces of terminology that gets used a lot these days is the concept of generative AI or language large language models or LLMs. Essentially what they are is models that are able to generate high quality natural language outputs such as text. So that would be things like chat GPT or code. Uh, and there are actually uh, AI sort of applications that can generate images as well. So things like mid journey. Um, and the content that they're able to produce is based on data on which they've been trained. So a lot of these um, AI models will use a lot of information off the internet as the basis for essentially their knowledge base. Um, and that's kind of where this uh, sort of interplay between AI and Web3 comes in, as we will see. So when it comes to looking at AI, at the moment, I would say there's probably rather more questions than answers uh, about kind of AI and its implications. Um, some of those relate to the content uh, that these AI tools produce. Um, so one of the concerns, for example, for brand owners is that there is a possibility that AI tools can generate uh, content that either is infringing of intellectual property or maybe inaccurate or potentially even defamatory. And obviously, there's a big open question about what brand owners may be able to do in those cases. Um, the content that's produced by AI tools is, is essentially dynamic. It's, it's kind of built on request based on a prompt. Um, and so any kind of monitoring of AI, produ AI produced content is, is quite difficult because it is you know, user specific and it's very dynamic. Um, there's also a bit of an open question as to who owns the rights uh, of content produced by AI. Is it the person who's put the prompt together? Is it the person who's constructed the AI tools? And again, there's a lot of still uncertainty about how this is all going to pan out. There's also uh, a number of kind of open questions and concerns uh, relating to the data on which AI tools are trained. Um, as I said, a lot of AI tools are based on general information that's available on the internet. Um, and there are a number of concerns that you know, there may be potentially breaches of IP protection um, associated with the use of that kind of open source data. Um, there are also, for sort of brand owners and corporations, um, cybersecurity risks. So in many cases, companies might train their AI application with kind of customer sensitive data so that they can then use that AI tool to answer questions about, you know, things like company strategies. But obviously, there's a number of concerns about where that data might be going. Is the AI tool 
sharing that with other people who are asking questions and is there therefore the potential for kind of sensitive information leakage. Uh, we're also seeing uh, a number of kind of use cases where fraudsters are using AI tools to generate more effective malware or phishing emails. So that's although that's not kind of changing the type of content that's that's kind of out there it is certainly increasing the ease with which criminals are able to put this content together um, on the flip side to that obviously there are you know some good aspects to ai uh, and what we are seeing in the industry is lots of brand protection service providers are starting to integrate more and more ai capabilities into their brand monitoring tools so you can think about things like uh, applications that are able to recognize product types or logos within products or are actually able to tune their monitoring and their keyword searching based on the patterns of infringement that these tools are seeing um, so I've mentioned a couple of times that there is a bit of a sort of interplay, if you like, between AI and Web3. Um, it's, so the way this has kind of manifest itself, so there were a few news stories kind of floating around, uh, really around the start of this year, um, where Web3 and the metaverse have been declared dead by various kind of industry experts and other industry leaders, uh, really because they were turning their attention towards developing AI applications instead. Now, as I've said, um, what these AI tools tend to do um, is they will use training data, which they source from other platforms. So a lot of these tools were getting their information from social media platforms, things like Reddit and Twitter and so on. And what happened off the back of that is that various of these platforms decided to introduce uh, initiatives to actually block this or at least monetize it in some way, rather than letting these AI tools just kind of use their data indiscriminately. Um, off the back of that, we saw various bits of social media being locked down to some degree. So for example, um, um, in April, we saw Reddit uh, announce a plan to charge for use of their data API, uh, which led to a number of subreddits or communities being made private or going dark. Uh, Twitter in July uh, announced a plan to limit the number of posts which these types of tools would be able to read uh, to prevent, um, as Elon Musk put it, extreme levels of data scraping and system uh, manipulation. Obviously, the problem with all of this is it's kind of seen as contrary to some of the values that you know, your, your internet users expect, expect, which is the ability to create and curate content and also, you know, have, have privacy and the selection of when and where to use your privacy built in. Um, so really, the upshot of all this is that some of the issues that arise from the development of these AI tools may drive users towards these type of Web3 technology that we were talking about, purely because they are less prone to regulation and restriction. Okay, so now actually delving into some of the data that we've looked at. So this is from a series of studies uh, that we've done over the last few months. So the first one um, is looking at blockchain domains, as, as we mentioned earlier. Now, at the current time, there are something like 7 million blockchain domains uh, registered. Um, they can be registered through a, a range of different providers. Uh, two of the main ones are ENS, the Ethereum name service. They offer .eth domains on the blockchain that is the same blockchain as it is the basis for the Ethereum cryptocurrency, hence the name. Um, they have registered so far just under 3 million domains for their users. Um, and there's another provider called Unstoppable Domains who actually offer blockchain domains across more than 10 different extensions. Uh, and, they've off and they've so far provided just under 4 million domains um, for their users. So you can see those two big players account between them for the vast majority of the blockchain domains that have been registered to date. Um, so what we wanted to do is take a bit of a look, uh, sort of a deep dive into this set of blockchain domains that have been registered to get a bit of an insight as to sort of any trends, patterns, types of use cases uh, for what's been registered so far. Um, so to do that, uh, we took a look at a particular data set of uh, .eth domains, so a subset of the full landscape. Uh, the reason we chose this particular subset is because um, the ETH domains we looked at were the ones registered through ENS, so it's a popular provider. There are plenty of statistics readily available, so there are tools and dashboards, things like June at Analytics, where you can actually get the information. Uh, and it, what that allows you to do is sort of drill down and get some highly granular data. So using that data, what we did was we looked at the last year's worth of, of .eth registrations, which accounts for about one and a half million domains. So it's it's something like you know about 20% of the full landscape, but it's hopefully a good proxy for the overall landscape. 
Um, so the first thing you can see here, the big graph at the bottom, um, is a track over the last year of the daily numbers of .eth registrations. And really what you can see is there was a big peak of activity sort of in late 2022, um, and that activity has then tailed off. And there are now, we're still seeing registrations happening, but at a lower level to what we were seeing in 2022. And really what we think was happening in that, that earlier period was that that was kind of, if you like, a kind of golden age of registrations where people were snapping up the short, desirable domain names. Uh, we, we saw actually in May 2022, there was a monthly trading volume of over $44 million in these blockchain domains, so huge amounts of activity going on. Um, and actually, if you look at uh, the smaller graph at the bottom, you can see that's actually showing you the median daily length of the domain names being registered on each day in that period. So you can indeed see that when there was that big peak of activity, sort of in late 2022, you can see there was actually a dip in the median length of the domain names that were being registered. So that kind of, again, is a bit of a confirmation that this period is when the shorter, more desirable domain names were being registered. Um, delving into that in a bit more detail, what we decided to then do was to look at um, the set of the domains within that kind of wider data set that contain the names of any of the top 10 most valuable global brands in 2023. So these are the big popular brands, the ones that if there was an infringement landscape, we would expect to see infringement. So you can see the list of brands possibly in that small key on the right of the graph. I'll just read through them very quickly. So we've got Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, McDonald's, Visa, Tencent, Louis Vuitton, MasterCard, and Coca-Cola. So really what we're, what we're saying is that this is really a proxy probably for the overall infringement landscape these 10 big brands are representative probably of what's going on more generally uh, and actually what we see um so just to explain the big graph you can see um th the 10 brands are sort of set front to back uh, and the timeline is left to right so you can see the monthly number of domain registrations with names containing each of those 10 brands so this is just looking at exact matches in this case. And again, you can see a sort of echo of what we saw on the previous slide. There was lots of activity, domains being registered in the late part of 2022, uh, and a bit of a tail off after that. Now, obviously, what's really interesting is that all of these domains, by definition, contain big brand names, uh, and they all have the potential uh, to be used for fraudulent purposes. You can see in the box on the right, there are some of examples of some of the domain names uh, that were being registered. And you can see they are very prominent uses of the brand names. Uh, and you know your average user could easily be fooled into thinking that these are legitimate domain names being operated by the brand in question. In general, that's not the case. So obviously there is concern that they could be used for fraudulent purposes. Um, and that's particularly accentuated by the fact that across this blockchain domain landscape, it's very difficult to monitor and enforce. So, you know, this is can be a real concern for brand owners. Um, just looking, most of the domains that we saw weren't being actively used to host these decentralized websites. So they may be used uh, sort of in a sort of cyber squatting sense. They may be intended for being uh, bought and sold later on. But we did see a few examples uh, where there were live websites being hosted on these domain names. Uh, in this case, most of those were not enormously highly threatening, although the one on the right, which is targeting the Tencent brand name, uh, that has some concern. It, it kind of resembles a server index page, which is the type of thing you often see uh, for a site that's under construction or maybe where there's hidden content buried somewhere within the directory structure. Uh, and some of the terminology in here uh, and some of the file names and directory names are a little bit concerning and suggest that maybe there is an intention that this site eventually may be associated with something like the distribution of malware. So again, we are seeing these things uh, that are concerning uh, and that you may want to kind of, you know, as a brain donor, keep an eye on. Um, when we actually extended the analysis to look at fuzzy matches, so that's not just exact matches, but where maybe one character is different from the official brand string, uh, or maybe a pair of characters is transposed, or there's an extra character or a character missing, what we do is we see lots more domains that have even more potential, if you like, for confusion and fraudulent use. So I know the screenshot is a little bit small, but you can see, for example, down the second column there, there's a number of domains all targeting the Amazon brand, and really they only differ from the uh, main Amazon brand name by maybe one character. And 
in many cases, the only difference is like a single accent over that ca character. So, you know, your, your casual internet user could look at these and could very easily be duped into thinking that this was an official Amazon blockchain domain presence. So again, lots of potential for uh, concern uh, and infringement here. Um, okay, so as we've talked, all the domains really we've talked about so far uh, are kind of the short, sort of potentially confusing domain names. And in fact, we do indeed see that across that data set of around one and a half million domains, the vast, vast majority are short domain names. So you can see here, 99.8% of our data set have domain name length. So in this case, we're talking about SLD. So SLD is the second level domain. So it's the part of the brand name to the left of the dot. So 99.8% of the data, data set have SLD lengths of 32 characters or fewer. However, we do see a long tail of much, much longer domain names. Now, one of the things to note about the uh, blockchain domain names is they, the domain names themselves can be very, very much longer than your sort of standard domain name. And we do see uh, some examples in the data set of domain names up to several thousand characters in length. Uh, and you can see actually the longest example we found in the data set was a nearly 39,000 character domain name. What are those domain names being used for? It, to some degree, it's a little bit of a mystery, but we will see some examples of what we think is going on in the, that data set of these very, very long domain names that people are registering. Um, so if we actually look at the longest domain names uh, in the data set, so this table is showing you the first 20 characters of each of the top, I think it's the top 15 or 20 longest domain names that we see. Um, actually, a lot of these domain names are pretty nonsensical. They consist of random passages of text, random lists of repeated characters. Uh, one thing that you can see in this, um, which maybe uh, a lot of users are maybe not familiar with, is that in these blockchain domains, you can actually include special characters in the domain names, things like emojis. And we do see lots of these. So you can see that one second from the bottom. That That is not a website content. That is actually the domain name. The domain name itself is a string of emoji characters dot something. In this case, it would be dot ETH. Um, so looking in a little bit more detail at some of the patterns in here, uh, what we're doing here is we're looking at a, a measure called domain name entropy. So uh, domain name entropy or Shannon entropy, as it's sometimes called, is, is a mathematical concept. Uh, what it allows us to do is analyze a domain name, so just the domain name itself, uh, and sort of quantify, so actually put a number on the measure of randomness or information contained within that domain name itself. So generally, if a domain name has high entropy, what that's telling you is that domain name consists of a large number of, particularly if they're non-repeated characters. If it's a large number of repeated characters or a much shorter domain name, it will tend to have lower entropy. Um, so the figure on the left um, is a histogram showing you uh, the value, the entropy values we see across the data, data set. So you can see there's a peak in the middle at an entropy value of about 2.4, um, and then the values tail off to either side. Um, the, the table on the right is showing you a scatter plot of the Shannon entropy of the domain names against the domain name length. So every dot on that um, on that graph represents one of the domains in the data set. Um, obviously, there's a lot of information in there. Um, some of the things to pull out is that some of the domains we do see have very high entropy values. So if you look, you may be able to see uh, in the graph on the left. Uh, there are a small number of domains cropping up at very high entropy values. So that's where we get these large numbers of non-repeated characters. So these big strings of emojis and other characters will tend to have high, high entropy. Um, the other thing to note is that on the graph on the right, some of the um, very longest domain names in the in the data set have very low or even zero entropy. So you can see there are these few little black dots sort of creeping along the bottom axis on the right hand side of that graph. What that is, is when you have a very long domain name, which is consisted of just a single character repeated many thousands of times. Um, so we do see people registering those for whatever reasons. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. The other thing to say is that, as I said, these, these blockchain domains can include uh, special characters as well as just kind of letters and numbers. We do actually see that there are nearly 3000 different characters represented in this data set. And we'll see a little bit more of that um, as we go on. Um, so 
obviously not all of the long domain names consist of repeated characters. There are uh, this class of what I have initially terming um, other special domain names. Uh, I do have another name that I use to describe them, but I won't tell you what that is just yet because I don't want to give the game away as to what we're looking at here. So this is one example of one of the long domain names uh, that consists entirely of a string of special characters. So again, bear in mind, this is not website content or anything. This is a domain name. So the domain name consists of a number of characters. Each character is a colored square. So this is your domain name, purple square, purple square, purple square, blah, 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 and so on, dot ETH. Um, and this is 1,024 characters long. Now, you know, looking at this, it's not entirely clear what the purpose of this is. Um, sort of looking at this in a bit more detail, um, sort of when I first started looking at these, uh, one thing I noticed is that sort of 1,024 is a kind of a special number uh, in computer science. It's 2 to the power of 10. It's also a square number, uh, and it's actually 32 squared. So kind of given the fact that this kind of looks like some sort of pixelated image, I kind of wondered what would happen if you displayed that domain name in a grid of 32 by 32. And if you do that, actually what you get is a little artwork. So it's like a kind of pixelated artwork, something in the style of, I guess, something like the Mona Lisa. This is the domain name itself. This is nothing to do with what's on that website. This is the domain name. So this really was the first user case that I'd come across um, of a domain name where the domain name itself is kind of a pixelated artwork, a bit like an NFT, if you like. And then when I started to delve into the data set in a bit more detail, we found that there were lots more of these. Um, so the number in each case is the number of characters in the domain name. So you can see we get a whole range of lengths of domain names that are being used in this way from a few hundred up to a few thousand. And there's a range of different types of imagery in here. So some of you will recognize uh, characters, Pokemon characters, characters from Donkey Kong, logos, and so on. So there does seem to be a market of people producing and registering these sort of what, I, what I'm now terming artwork blockchain domain names. Uh, within that, you even see sort of sort of deeper patterns, if you like. So we found a set of five uh, blockchain domain names, all of length 577 characters, again, which kind of seem to form a series of artworks. These are even kind of like numbered artworks, kind of like you might consider these, you know, one in a series of however many. Uh, and you can actually see the first, sorry, the second, third, and fourth, and fifth character uh, in each of these domain names at the top left of the image is actually a string of numbers. So it's almost as if these artworks are being sort of numbered to make them more tradable and more desirable. So what does all this mean? Um, doing a bit of a summary as to sort of what we've seen for blockchain domains generally. Um, we've seen, obviously, that there was a peak in registrations generally uh, in 2022 when numerous short domain names were registered. And thereafter, we see a bit of a drop off in numbers, uh, but we're still seeing ongoing registrations, ongoing activity, um, and kind of, of the most recent blockchain domains, the median domain length is about nine characters. Um, Many hundreds of the domain names within the data set contain either exact or fuzzy matches to popular brand names. So there's a lot of potential there for confusion, fraudulent use, and sort of different types of brand infringement. So really, this highlights uh, the importance of building capabilities for brand owners to monitor this content and enforce against it where infringements are detected. Um, the last bit I'm talking about are these examples of these extremely long domain names. And really, they tend to fall into sort of two main groups, if you like. So there's one which is the sort of nonsensical or repetitive domain names. So the ones that kind of consist of a single character just repeated multiply. Um, and they're the ones I showed you most recently, these kind of graphical artwork domain names. So what does that mean? What it means potentially is that we're seeing a bit of a trend moving away from what you would consider the core uses of blockchain domain names, so, so things like these cryptocurrency wallets, um, into different ways that the domain names themselves are being used uh, and actually built at all. Um, and this may be something to do with the fact that there's no sort of central government of the blockchain domain landscape, so people are finding their own use cases for them. Part of what we're seeing here is, is I think, um, some, some move towards collectability of these domain names. So a bit like NFTs, they are building these either very long or graphical domain names, which are tradable. Uh, we are, we're starting to see something that's sort of familiar from the concept of people who are familiar with things like domain clubs. So these will be things where people register 
and collect sets of domains with common characteristics. So people might collect domain names that are all over 10,000 characters in length, for example. So part of this is to do with that. Uh, the, gra the graphical artworks are probably part of that as well. But what's really interesting is that within those graphical artworks, we are seeing the potential for new kinds of infringement. So some of you may have noticed, and some of you may be familiar with, um, the CryptoPunks, which is a set of NFTs. Uh, there was actually a recent law lawsuit relating to an infringement of those. Uh, what they look like, these are sort of standard NFTs we're talking about now. So these are little kind of pixelated artworks looking like little characters. Um, we've got some examples of those in the box at the bottom right. And actually, if we step back, you know, I think it's not too much of a stretch to say that these look very similar to those. And potentially, there is even a case to say that maybe they are infringing um, the, the, you know, the CryptoPunks um, IP. Um, so again, that's something something to watch for the future. Okay, um, sort of in the second sort of shorter part of the, of the presentation, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the developments we've seen uh, in the new GTLD program. So some of you, I'm sure many of you, in fact, will be familiar with the new GTLD program. So it actually launched initially back in 2012 uh, and consisted of a series of new domain name extensions added to the internet root zone, to the highest level of the DNS. So what happened is people were able to apply to run new domain name extensions. Um, several thousand applications were submitted. Since the start of the program, around 1,200 of those um, have been delegated, which kind of means they've moved into the potential for active use. And around half of those um, have already passed through the start uh, of their sunrise period, which is basically the initial phase of launch uh, where brand owners are actually able to apply for domains before they go into general availability. Um, so really what you can see um, in, in the graph there, so that is the red line is the rise over time in the number of delegated uh, extensions. The green line is the rise over time of the number of those extensions which have gone through their sunrise period. In general, there tends to be a bit of a delay between the two. And in some cases, that's due to sort of disputes or discussions over how those extensions are going to be managed and how they're going to be used. Um, within the data set of, of new GTLD, so the sort of thousand odd new extensions that have been released in the last uh, 10 or 11 years, uh, there's a, a range of different types um, of TLDs. So some of those are descriptive. So you may have come across things like .bank, .insurance, which are kind of designed obviously to be uh, descriptive of the type of website content that's there. Um, and there are also things like .brands. So brand owners can actually apply to, to run their own .brand extension. So for example, uh, Barclays Bank uh, registered dot Barclays and they host many of their main corporate websites on a dot Barclays extension, which is, you know, great for being able to educate your customers. That that's where your official websites are and anything outside of that potentially um, is an infringement. Um, really, some of the issues that we've seen uh, in the sort of new GTLD landscape so far is that many of the extensions are disproportionately targeted by abuse. So we see disproportionately more websites on these new extensions being used for things like phishing, malware, brand infringements, and so on, uh, than we do across some of the older, more familiar TLDs. Um, and there's a few reasons why that's the case, even though many of these new extensions have brought in improved enforcement and blocking processes. And really, the main reason why we're seeing this abuse on these extensions is generally because it's pretty low cost to register domains, and there's often not much uh, sort of stringent requirements over who can register them. So they're very popular with infringers. We have also seen sort of as, as the landscape has played out uh, that there have been a number of issues where there have been disputes over who would control a particular extension. So for example, Amazon, there was a long ongoing dispute between Amazon, the brand owner, um, and a number of countries in South America and kind of the Amazon region over who would ultimately control that extension, which has actually only been resolved fairly recently. However, when it comes to um, kind of what we might look at going forwards, there is actually a new round of applications set to launch uh, in 2026. So again, something there where brand owners might want to think about whether they want to apply to run a new extension, maybe they want to apply to run their own dot brand extension. Um, in terms of what's happened in the GTLD landscape most recently, um, 
There have been 14 new extensions entering their sunrise periods this year. Uh, they're listed here. Uh, and some of those do have specific security risks associated with them. So I, I mentioned we were going to talk in a little bit of detail about one of those extensions, .zip. Um, so that is a domain name extension, a bit like .com. Um, but obviously, it is also a file name extension. So you, many people will be familiar with zip files, a kind of data compression file. So there is the potential for confusion between a domain name and a file extension. And there's a number of ways in which that confusion can manifest itself. Um, it could be that uh, file names are sometimes interpreted as U URLs by email clients. Um, there is the potential um, for the owner of a website to harvest potentially sensitive information. So for example, um, if you were to register um, a, the domain doc.zip, uh, somebody online who's request, who's trying to access a file with a sensitive file name dot doc as a zip file, depending on the client they're using, that client could interpret that as a request for the website. Um, and if you're the website owner, you could view that request and that would potentially give you information on the file name of that sensitive document that was being requested. So there's some sort of slightly subtle security issues going on with these. Uh, and obviously various other ways in which this, these threats can manifest themselves. So, you know, there's potential for malicious domains to be disguised as links to files and so on. Um, this is all not, not just hypothetical. We did see uh, phishing attacks targeting a number of big brands within a week of launch of, of the extension, the .zip extension. Um, within two months after the extension launched, about 30,000 domains had been registered, so quite a lot of uptake. Uh, and you can see the list of domain name, second level domain names that were registered, apk.zip, css.zip, you know, these are all file name suffixes. So they, they all potentially have the same security risk as what I mentioned just now for, for doc. Um, and also within the dot zip uh, sort of landscape, we saw well over 300 domains featuring what we would term high risk keywords, things like update, install, download, invoice, the types of keywords that you would expect to see for domains that are being used potentially for phishing or malware distribution. Here are some examples. This is three dot zip websites. Uh, three domains which result to active websites, I should say. Um, they all kind of sort of host their content and present it in different ways, but they all have the potential to be distributing malicious files. So again, there's a real suggestion that people are, are kind of using these hooks to actually distribute malware to internet users. Um, this is a bit of a plot, again, looking at um, Shannon Entropy. So this is the entropy of the domain names. Um, so again, I won't go into this in too much detail. I'm, I'm aware we're sort of starting to run short of time. Um, the blue histogram there is the spread of entropy we might expect in a typical data set of domains. Uh, that's actually from previous study. Um, and the red histogram is for the .zip registrations. And you can see that actually the peak for .zip is a, a much higher entropy value than for your sort of usual standard domain data set. So what that's telling us is that .zip is disproportionately highly populated with long nonsensical, these high entropy domain names. And various studies have noticed that these types of domain names are quite often indicative that the registrations are automated. And it's the sorts of things that people will do when they want to use those domains for fraudulent use. So things like for malware distribution or for creation of phishing sites on random and sort of throwaway domain names. So just to wrap up, um, so we've covered quite a lot there. Um, there's a few, I guess, main main flavors of what we've talked about. So the first one is to say that various, although you know, there's no actual necessarily tie between AI and Web3, what we've seen is that a number of the developments and the events surrounding the developments in AI actually drive indirectly a number of issues relating to brand and IP protection and could potentially push people towards the use of uh, Web3 technologies where there's kind of more, more privacy. Um, there is also obviously a lot of open questions about you know, kind of the legal status of various AI and Web3 products. And I think probably going forward over the next few years, there will be some requirements for updated legislation to reflect the new threats. Um, obviously, we've mentioned that AI technologies going forward are more likely to be incorporated into brand monitoring and enforcement tools to help combat some of these threats. So it's kind of a bit of a double-edged sword, really. Um, the Web3 landscape more generally presents a number of new risks for brand and IP infringements. And obviously, we've looked specifically at blockchain domains. Um, some of the uh, other applications and threats that we've not really talked about, but I'll just kind of touch on. 
Um, so the fact that there's no centralized governments raises the possibility for name collisions. So that's things like the same domain name potentially existing on multiple blockchains or there being collisions between Web3 and classic Web2 um, domains. Uh, we are seeing a number of uh, initiatives to try and combat some of these issues. So things like the Web3 Alliance hopefully is going to help sort of resolve some of these issues. We're also sort of seeing in the in the blockchain domain landscape a number of associated technologies. So there's the concept of name wrapping, which is where uh, people will trade blockchain subdomains. So, you know, somebody can run a blockchain domain name and they can sell subdomains of that domain name uh, as kind of, you know, blockchain domain kind of pieces of currency in their own right. Uh, we're also seeing the emergence of these DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, which are entities managed by blockchain based programs. So we are starting to see that being used to do things like administer company votes and company decisions. So again, lots of open questions about the implications of that as well. Uh, we're starting to see the emergence of some new trends in the use of blockchain domains. So we've talked a lot about these collectible and trade tradable domains. Um, and obviously the new G GTLD program, the thing we talked about last, that is continuing. Uh, obviously we're seeing security risks. So things like what we were seeing with .zip uh, and potentially we see more of the same um, with the new round of applications set to begin in a couple of years time. Um, one, of the, one of the issues where I talked about um, name collisions, that that has a potential as i've said between web 2 and web 3 so one example we have seen of that um, one provider one web 3 provider is offering io blockchain domains web 3 domains uh, but obviously io is also an existing web 2 extension so again there's a possibility that the same domain can exist in two different contexts and you know what happens in terms of how browsers interpret that what's the ip implications of it and so on um so just to wrap up some sort of additional considerations for brand owners really i think we've highlighted highlighted the uh, the importance of proactive monitoring uh, and enforcement and in some cases that will require new technologies and new enforcement procedures um as things continue to progress we might want to see brand owners thinking about their defensive registration strategy across the blockchain domain extensions and the new GTLDs, maybe where they don't want to register a dot brand, obviously making use of things like blocking or alerting mechanisms, obviously dot, dot brand extensions. There's lots of use cases for that, which again, we can talk about in more detail uh, in a subsequent session. Um, kind of the final thing I'll leave you with is obviously, you know, dot com still kind of is king in the domain name worlds in some ways. It's still by far the most popular extension. But we are starting to maybe see an environment where people, brand owners, will maybe need to think about moving away from .com for their primary web presence. Um, and there's a few reasons why that may be the case. Firstly, actually, a lot of the dot land, dot .com landscape is already taken. So the vast majority of all two, three, and four-letter .com domains are already taken many of the five letter domain names. So there's actually not a lot left in terms of short strings. Um, for some of the other um, extensions, so for three letter domain names across .net and .org, there's also no, no real availability. But actually, now that we've got this vast landscape of new GTLDs, um, there's a lot more options open uh, to brand owners so who maybe want to use maybe more descriptive uh, domain name extensions for their websites. So we might start to see more of what we've seen in terms of this repurposing of TLDs. So we've seen things like .ao being used for technology companies, .ai for artificial intelligence companies and so on. That's not what those extensions were for. They were originally country code extensions in their own right, but they've kind of been repurposed uh, for new sort of business applications. We might see similar things going on elsewhere. And I guess the final thing to say is, you know, the, given this low availability of domain names, it kind of builds the case uh, for brand owners to, or maybe people who are looking to build a new brand or product name to select a novel or invented brand term. So there is that availability um, of domains that they might want to register, but also uh, a domain name that is more, sorry, a brand name that is more distinctive uh, and has less overlap with pre-existing content also provides the potential uh, for stronger IP protection going forwards. Um, so that's all I have. I will stop sharing uh, and then I'll cut back to the hosts and we can kind of wrap up. Well, thank you, David, for such an extensive and like very comprehensive overview on the landscape uh, of the Web3 and also like touching the GTLD, the, the new round of the GTLDs. It's super interesting and I got so many insights from today's presentation. Thank you very much for that. And Richard, what do you think about like this Web3 versus Web2 landscape? Uh, what is your opinion on that? 
I, I think it's interesting, especially now when it's getting like a few uh, big uh, resolvers, like you have quad one, quad eight. Like, what happens if they start implementing the like? So it's not only the normal DNS system, the root DNS system, but also other uh, Intel. Because let's say Google, yes, okay, let's just do uh, another. We just add more uh, root servers in there. And then that just spins into okay, we get like two different internets, like one with one quad eight, and one maybe Cloudflare does something with quad ones. Then it's uh, a whole different game, and also like toolbars and other things to be able to access these kind of non standard uh, DNS uh, domain names. Yeah. And for example, when it comes to the brand, oh, that is like the question from me. <laughs> we have also pre-submitted questions, so I will come back to them uh, as well. Uh, when it comes to the brand owners, should they focus and uh, focus their efforts strategy for the next year only at the Web three, or they should also share that like strategy for the Web two? And like this, a little bit of the battle between the Web three and the ICANN, is it like mutually exclusive or like? Uh, how, how, how do you see that, like David, Rickard? I think that's the question for both uh, of you. Yeah, I think. I mean, I, I think you, both things have to be taken together. Um, I, I certainly don't think we're going to, not anytime soon, move away from sort of the classical Web two yeah. content online. You know, not least because people are familiar with it, infringers are familiar with it, and actually, if anything, the more you move more towards Web three, the more you kind of leave Web two unchecked and unwatched. Um, so I, th I certainly think, you know, Web2 is going to continue to be a significant presence on the internet for years to come, and brand owners certainly need to be mindful of it. In terms of the investment in Web3, um, I think to some degree it remains to be seen. Um, I mean, there hasn't yet been a massive uptake, and I think I think it's fair to say in blockchain domains, metaverse, NFTs, they're there, they spike, they go down again. But you know, where where one trend ends, another one begins. So I think it's really important for brand owners to be ma mindful of the landscape where we know that there are things happening. Of course, make, you know, keep keep an eye on them, keep the monitoring in place. If something dies a death in a year or two's time, then fine, no harm done. But th there will be other trends taking their place. And as long as these technologies are out there, you know, infringers will be using them, fraudsters will be using them, customers will be using them. So you need to keep an eye on the landscape. But I think you need to, and again, it's a big, big flavor of, you know, whenever I talk about this stuff, I think you need to consider things holistically. You can't ne neglect one area in favor of others. You need to kind of keep a good overview of what's going on. And I think that's probably generally true in the infringement landscape. But And that's why this industry is so big, because like, as a brand owner, you can't keep track of all this, and that's why there's companies yeah. like agencies yeah. that work with it. I guess that half of our audience here is people working in the industry to help to make like decisions or help uh, organizations make these kind of decisions. And like you said, maybe one TLD goes up, and then you focus on that for a few years. Okay, it goes down or one area, and then you just not, not renew those domain names. So don't focus on that kind of brand name. Yeah. It's just a natural project, projection of and progress of uh, of the business and how it works, and that's like the same thing coming back to the like the new TLDs and dot zip and like all the other issues that we are, like little issues we have seen with the new uh, GTLDs, and give it what is it three and a half years down the line there will be an, a set of couple of thousand new TLDs and then there will be a debate okay and all those new registries will try to get new registrations and try to make some money because they don't want to go bankrupt because if you have a TLD and no registration you don't, you don't have any money and then it's a and I think that's an issue that I think I can should address that like you need you can't just start the TLD going in and you're only going to business uh, business plan is to hand out free domain names. Like, yeah. not TK, try that 25 years ago. <laughs> not super impressed with that. You've had another, a few other uh, TLDs have tried it for the last, what is it, eight years? Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, we'll see. But I hope that won't happen again. Yeah. I think that is really interesting. And, and it seems to me that we touched a little bit this topic on our pre during our previous webinar. 
on the brand protection and that we mentioned that if domain names cost a bit higher then the the level of the infringement and abuse uh could have been lower right and a dot zip also has been mentioned during our previous webinar so it's getting uh popular <laughs> Or not popular, depends how you see it. The bad way popular, not, yeah, notoriously popular. Yeah, I think I think it's I I kind of think of um, a lot of these ideas in the same sort of way, which is the same way I think of things like defensive registrations. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people think defensive registrations is the answer to everything. If you register every possible permutation of your brand name with every possible keyword, then nobody can ever infringe you. I mean, a that's totally unsustainable from a cost point of view, but actually, it, it doesn't. You know, it will only ever get you so far because there are always other variants that infringers can can use. I think so. It's about finding the balance. You need to, um, you know, when it comes to, you know, should you register your brand name across these new GTLDs, these new blockchain domain extensions? I think, you know, maybe for the high risk, high visibility, high priority ones, you register your exact brand name to make sure that nobody else is registering what obviously looks like your official website. Um, but you do it on a kind of case by case basis and, you know, focus on things that actually you might want to use in the future and things where you know that there's a particular risk of infringement. But I think like with everything, there's a balance. You've got to find the balance between being proactive in terms of what you do defensively and then not so much reactive, but, you know, putting monitoring in place to track what the third parties are doing and then, you know, dealing with those things as after they crop up rather than sort of preventing them from yeah. block up, cropping up. So I think it's a bit of a balance. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we still have uh, time to address uh, a question or two. So we have a question from Athira. Given the decline in blockchain domain registration, is it advisable to increase the investment in these domains? Um, Rikard, what do you think? But again, it's, a bit like, it's all depending on what, first of all, brand, yeah, but also on terms of Okay, maybe you only do the exact match. Maybe you try to say, okay, what can I do? Or just keep it, keep have it in the plan. If mm -hmm. you see there's upswing of it, again, then you can do it. So it's not always like you, just so you're aware of it. You as a brand owner or you as an agency that work to help the brand owners that this could happen. And if it swings up, something happens, then okay, this is how we tend how we plan to protect it. That's yeah, true. I think that's right. I mean, it's, um, it's yeah, it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before. Um, you know, you need to find that balance between keeping an eye on it and, you know, spending all your money to sort of, you know, on it. But it, it's one of these things you keep keep an eye on the landscape, register the things that you might want to use. And, and you know, as Rick, I said, it's, it, it, it depends very much on your, your business and your business model. You know, if you've got if you're the type of business that is going to be likely to want to operate in the decentralized world in the metaverse then obviously it's going to be more relevant for you i guess the other thing to pull out of that question it's interesting yes we've seen a decline but what that means is that a lot of the kind of high relevance domain names have already been registered so actually you know you kind of then maybe you're dealing with a different problem are oh, the the domains that you would have wanted to register already registered by someone else if so you know you need to track the content you need to maybe track them being traded those types of things so again you know the landscape's changing over time but that doesn't necessarily mean you know that it is or isn't a good reason to kind of do a particular action you just i think need to keep an overview of the landscape as it changes yeah to keep the track of it and be aware as as you both mentioned that's absolutely true and the last question for today, um, we have what kind of blockchain domain infringements have been discovered yet, given the increase in the brand registration? Yeah, it's an interesting one. So, I mean, I guess there's there's, there's a few different types of infringement you might want to talk about. Um, obviously, we have the potential for infringements within the blockchain domain name itself. So that could be, it could just be sort of the what you would think of as a familiar domain name infringement so a, a brand name or a brand variant being used in the domain name uh, or it could actually be you know if we start thinking about these graphical artwork domain names we could imagine you know cases where ip protected imagery is being used in these domain names as well so company logos you know we're already seeing things like the crypto punks the pokemon characters the donkey kong characters so we're already seeing that sort of thing some of those potentially are are, are being traded so there is you know potential of, of ip infringement there um 
and obviously you know then going one stage further um you know with that that's not even talking about the content that might be hosted on the associated websites so again they potentially have got all of the same types of infringements or the potential for the same types of infringements as we see in the traditional web 2 um sort of domain landscape and particularly i think as browsers are more natively able to support access to blockchain domains, then I think we're going to probably start seeing more infringement. Um, I think, you know, looking at the domain names that I showed in the presentation, the ones that contain the names of the top 10 brands, the vast majority of those don't resolve to any mm. live website content yet. Mm. Um, but so, you know, what, what are these people doing? Are they cyber squatting? Are they registering them to trade them later? Maybe sell them back to the brand owner? Or are they, you know, you, you look at how potentially confusing some of those domain names are. You know, they're the, the sort of things in the Web2 landscape we would expect to be being used for phishing sites or, you know, for email senders addresses. So again, I think we need to kind of keep an, keep an eye on that as it goes forward. So I think a lot, of, a lot of the landscape is kind of almost being registered speculatively at the moment, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if we start seeing more active use as time goes on. Absolutely. Well, it seems that we will all still have a lot of work when it comes to the blockchain domain names, especially in the brand protection area. So, uh, a lot of the projects, I guess, coming in uh, for, the brand, uh, for the brand protection companies and agencies. Um, yeah, so I guess we are running out of time. Uh, really big thanks to you, uh, David, and for you, to Eurekert for the insightful talk, for the great presentation. Really appreciate that. For all of the attendees who were today with us, we'll be sending the recording and the slides of the presentation. I think it would be really great to have a look at it after. And uh, again, just wanted to mention that as the special um, offer uh, of this webinar, we are offering a brand check. So we'll be posting a link again into the chat uh, and you can follow that and submit a brand you, that you'd like to run a check on and we'll be coming back to you with a very comprehensive uh, report on that uh, brand. So feel free to use it. And if you have any questions, uh, follow up, uh, follow us on uh, social media and feel free to reach out and we'll be happy to answer all of your questions. Thank you for today and have a great rest of the week. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.